What do you think of when you think of the Bay Area? You probably think of San Francisco, Oakland, the Golden State Warriors, Silicon Valley, Stanford, or Berkeley. But how much do you really know about Berkeley? Perhaps that it claims to be the number one public university in the country and in the world, or that it prides itself on its historical contributions to both the scientific community and to society itself in the form of protests. However, every success story has its faults or secrets, and UC Berkeley is no exception. Behind this gate lies a dark secret that this institution would not want you to know about, but I am here to tell you what you should know rather than what you have been told. My name is Victor Villalobos, and I am a third year student here at the University of California, Berkeley, majoring in political science. In the time that I have been here, I have realized that there is more to the school than just the classes or the clubs or the culture that this school showcases. The history of this school is something that needs to be mentioned, and there is no better time to do that than now, in the present. In this video, I will speak to several students about some of the monuments on campus, and we will see whether or not they know about the history of them. After each question is asked, I will proceed to shed light on its true history and challenge what Natsu Taylor Saito calls the master narrative, or the belief that institutions such as this one create to steer our attention away from the more concerning matters at hand. But first, let's get to know the people that are being in the uh, Yo, what's up guys? My name's Pranit Panda. I'm a junior at Cal. I'm studying Eeks. Uh, and some of the stuff I do at Cal uh, is I'm part of the stand-up comedy club. My name is Pranesh Kumar. I am a second year and my major is electrical engineering and computer science. Hi, my name is Aron Baeza. I am a transfer student from Riverside City College. Um, I am a senior at the moment and I study sociology. My name is Maylise. I am a sophomore here at Berkeley. Um, my major is global studies and at Berkeley, I am part of the UCB Run travel team. I, am, uh, I give tours. Um, I am part of the Ultimate Frisbee team, I am also part of the Rock Climbing Club, um, and I do a lot of stuff just around the, Fal the Cal Falcons community, so yeah. My name is Diego Hammernick, uh, I'm a junior level transfer studying anthropology and looking into minoring in environmental science, and I mainly participate in research on campus. Uh, I'm an undergraduate research fellow in the anthropology department. Let's now see what they know about the renaming of Halls at Berkeley and about Alfred Kroeber a key anthropological figure in particular. What do you know about the renaming of halls in Berkeley? Yeah, so I know that they're just renaming a bunch of the halls because uh, apparently the people who the halls were named after were racist or something like that. I speculate that certain halls in UC Berkeley campus have been renamed due to the names that were given to those halls being affiliated with racism or uh, some kind of mistreatment of, uh, of different racial groups. Um, for example, I've heard that uh, Kruger Hall, which is the anthropology building, uh, was renamed because of because a person was affiliated with mistreating indigenous people. What I understand of it is um, there's history associated with some of the names of these of different halls. I don't have the specific examples, but I've just heard that uh, the renaming happens by um, through protests or you know, activism and essentially removing a name that um, has history, um, like negative history. I know that several halls have been renamed, such as Philosophy Hall and Social Sciences Building, I believe, um, and it was over concerns that the people that these buildings were originally named after had um, some racist or like homophobic history, maybe xenophobic. Um, I don't remember what the hall, like what the hall's previous names were though. I know that actually the uh, anthropology and art practice building was formerly named Krober Hall and they renamed that due to some of the injustices committed by the former namesake. Do you know about Alfred Krober? Uh, not really. I don't, I don't think I've heard of that name before but I think he might be the guy who started like a supermarket chain. Um, all I know is that Alfred Kroger mistreated indigenous people. I don't know too much about the details. Do you know anything about Alfred Krober? No. I do not. He's an awful person, yeah. Um, he exhumed a ton of Native American remains um, for, you know, study. Um, and, you know, against the wishes of, of many indigenous folks, he went on their tribal lands and took bodies out of the graves. Uh, he also owned uh, a Native American man um, that he basically used kind of like as entertainment for people. It was it was under the guise of it was supposed to be educational or whatever, but um, he was kind of just living entertainment. Um, 
and then also um, uh, amongst many controversies, he declared the Ohlone people uh, culturally extinct, um, you know, when they were very well here and well. Broadly speaking, it appears that the people being interviewed understand the general concept of why the halls were renamed. However, there is still some information that students might not see. For example, looking at something that Diego expanded upon in his answer, Alfred Krober presided over a department that acquired thousands of indigenous human remains and used them to experiment and try and understand the indigenous community. In addition, Barrows Hall, now known as the Social Sciences Building, was renamed due to David Barrows being, being racist towards the Philippines, as well as colonizing their education system. But what about the history of one of the school's primary donors, the Hearst family? Let's see what they have to say about the Hearst name. Uh, when you think of the word Hearst, what comes to mind? Uh, Hearst Mining, Hearst Castle. Um, I think he was also a pretty rich guy. Immediately what comes to mind is the Hearst Mining Circle and the Hearst Mining Building, two of the oldest buildings on campus. I know that they were mining buildings, um, and that's what the halls were affiliated with. When you think of the word Hearst, what comes to mind? Nothing specifically. I think of the Hearst Women's Gym um, and the Hearst Gymnasium. I believe also it was just the Hearst family that donated money for those buildings. Um, I also believe that John Galen Howard designed one of those buildings. Um, nothing about the Hearst family itself, though. Uh, the Hearst family, um, same ones. Uh, Hearst Castle, newspaper owner, uh, also infamous antiquarians. Uh, you know, they like to go to foreign places and take home goodies. You know, they're, they were grave robbers, basically. All the students have an idea that the Hearst family are contributors to the school, given their names on a variety of things, such as the Hearst Mining Circle, which we are currently in. Interestingly enough, Right behind me is a George Hurst plaque that is seeking to honor somebody who's classified as honest and a good miner, among many things that is mentioned here. However, it is interesting to see that calling it's, that the sign is calling the Hurst all these great things, but it does not mention anywhere on here what the Hurst did to acquire some of the property and some of their earnings. Specifically, George Hurst was responsible for forcing indigenous Andean peasants into debt bondage in Peru's copper mines and exploiting the native Sioux lands in the Midwest. Given this information, it goes to show that students only know that the name is that, just the name with no significance for the most part. And as mentioned already, we already see that there's already things named after them, Hearst Mining Circle, Hearst Avenue, and Hearst Castle. Now, let's turn our attention to one of the most iconic monuments in all of Berkeley, the ball situated next to the Sather Tower. What do you know about the ball that's outside of the Campanile? Yeah, yeah, the ball. So if you like rub it or like kiss it or something, you get a 4.0. I know that the ball outside of the Campanile is called the 4.0 ball. Uh, there's like rumors that if you rub the ball, then it helps to give you good luck and to get a 4.0 GPA. But I don't know too much about the history of the 4.0 ball. Do you know anything about the ball that is outside of the Sather Tower Campanile? No, I haven't seen it. Yeah, that ball is called 4.0 ball. Um... It's on the campaign of Esplanade, there's a lot of myths surrounding it. People like to believe that if you like lick it or touch it before an exam, it'll give you good luck. Um, I do know that there is supposedly some like anti-native history associated to it. I'm not entirely sure. Four put a wall? Everyone seems to believe that this ball only has a superstition revolving academic success for exams, and that is completely fine especially since it has become a fountain in the culture for current and future generations of Berkeley students. Every day, people pass the ball as visitors on a tour or as regular students. Some might even touch the ball in hopes of having luck, but nobody knows the truth of the ball, and the, and the sample of students that have been interviewed thus far are cut from the same cloth of the majority of people that walk around here. Nobody knows that the fountain is actually called the John Mitchell Fountain, and that John Mitchell was a member of the military who had campaigns against the tribes in South Dakota and Texas, and the ball above the fountain, which is this one, alludes to a cannibal of some kind. The school, which seeks to honor the indigenous people, never mentions on their website that what this actually is, rather more they tend to tag along with what students say and call it the 4.0 ball. Moving onward, one of the reasons why the school is situated where it is is because of the creek that sits next to these campus grounds, which is Strawberry Creek. With that in mind, let's see what the students have to say about the creek. 
Yeah, Strawberry Creek um, starts in the canyons, then it goes through campus, uh, and then it goes underground after that. Um, yeah, and then uh, for one time it was like brown because some leak happened in Haas. That's, that's about all I know. I know that Strawberry Creek is a creek that runs through campus. Uh, it starts from the Berkeley Hills and just runs through campus. The campus was kind of built around Strawberry Creek. There are multiple like bridges in campus that go over Strawberry Creek. Um, and yeah, I know that like when it gets really rainy on campus, the creek like swells with water. And what do you know about Strawberry Creek? Nothing at all. Strawberry Creek is one of the reasons that Berkeley was like built where it was. Um, it served as a water source and a waste evacuation system. Um, I don't know if there's like any, I suppose there's native history associated to it. Not that I know about it. Um, I know that Berkeley polluted it a lot until like it just couldn't be used anymore. And then it was, I believe, a PhD students to like clean it up. And now it's known officially as Berkeley's only li living laboratory. This is all stuff from Torres. Um, I think that's it for Strawberry Creek. And do you know anything about Strawberry Creek? No. It is no surprise that the true history of Strawberry Creek is unknown to the students of this campus. And while it is true that the creek does flood, as mentioned by a few people already, that alone is not enough to honor its history and to do this place justice. Strawberry Creek was a shell meant to the Ohlone people prior to the arrival of the Spanish. It eventually got taken over and the Ohlone were removed and other indigenous people. UC Berkeley actually has a plaque on a rock, which was already shown previously, that commemorates the Spanish military expedition under the auspices of the Empire of Spain, which was already shown. This monument is one of many that proves that the school has not done enough to showcase what they have done to become the institution that it is today, and it is time to change that. One final thing to note about the Spanish occupation within the Bay Area was the actual reasonings and justifications for why they did what they did in terms of conquering and slaughtering those that lived here. And it kind of deals with how they perceived uh, the people in the New World. For example, they were perceived to be barbarians. And this is due to a religious reason in a sense that anyone who did not identify with the religion of the Spanish, which is Christianity and deviations of it, were seen as barbarians. And typically a barbarian, in from a political theory standpoint at the time, if a barbarian were to deny somebody from Europe, in particular the Spanish, if they were to deny them what is theirs by the law of nations, which in a sense is basically saying that if there is unoccupied land, then it is yours to take. And barbarians were not considered people to occupy the land to some extent. And if these barbarians were to actually commit an offense to those that were getting willing to get or wanting to get, sorry, what is actually theirs, then an action would be taken against these barbarians in the form of war, which is one of the many justifications for why the Spanish did what they did here. Throughout the course of the interviews and from what has been gathered from everything that has been said by the students, it is evident that these students did not have general ideas behind the dark truth of the monuments that were discussed in this video. And it's not surprising, given the master narrative that the school has imposed upon students, such as the ones that were interviewed, and not just them, but on every single student here on this campus, it is impossible to see a future in which students are, are aware of everything that has been discussed thus far. An interesting thing to point out, however, was how Diego, the anthropology major that was mentioned, was well informed about the truth about some of the things that were mentioned. Because it would appear that those in the departments that were directly involved in the dark past, being that Diego is from the anthropology department, where Alfred Krover was a part of, that he was where he was a part of, given that he was directly involved in the dark past, or that he was in the department where the dark past was involved, then it only seems right that he should know about these things, and rightfully so. Nevertheless, that is not enough. We as students have the right and responsibility to inform everyone around us about this. And I feel like, and I hope that this video has been enough to begin a movement. So please share this video to anyone you might know because the quicker we work together to expose the truth, the better our chances are in making the school admit what it has done is immoral and unjust. Thank you.